Welcome to Philadelphia as it looked in 1842. You are about to go on a journey exploring the life and legacy of this man, Octavius Valentine Caddo, a 19th century educator, intellectual, athlete, and civil rights activist. Although his story is not widely known, he was a trailblazer of his time. One hundred years before what we think of as the civil rights movement, he fought unequal treatment on public transportation before Rosa Parks, broke through racial barriers in baseball before Jackie Robinson, and eventually gave his life in his fight for equal rights before Martin Luther King Jr. Our tour begins at 814 South Street, Caddo's home in Philadelphia. He lived here during his most active time in the city. As you will see, it is central to many of the organizations of which he was an active member. Today, an official historical marker stands outside the house to commemorate his life and achievements. About two blocks west is the original building of the Institute for Colored Youth, or ICY. Like Caddo's home, it also bears the distinction of having a historical marker. When Caddo's family returned to Philadelphia from New Jersey in 1854, he became a student at ICY, studying such subjects as Latin, Greek, geometry, and trigonometry. After graduating in 1858, Caddo completed a year of postgraduate work in Washington, D.C., and then returned to Philadelphia, where he was hired first as a teacher of English at ICY, then later became principal of the mail department. Here is a picture of notable staff members. This is Caddo. He continued teaching at ICY until his death in 1871, passing on his love of learning to the next generation of black scholars. The ICY moved out to Delaware County in 1902 and still exists today, though it is known as Cheney University of Pennsylvania. It remains as the oldest African-American school of higher education. This is the original building as it looks today. As we move farther west, we find the Banneker Literary Institute and the home of yet another historical marker. This early African-American intellectual society was founded in 1854 by Jacob C. White, Jr., and other aspiring African-American young men, and named in honor of Benjamin Banneker, a self-taught African-American scientist and astronomer. Here is a woodcut print of Banneker. The Institute was active until 1872. Upon his return to Philadelphia in 1859, Caddo not only became a teacher at ICY, but was elected full member of the Institute and became its recording secretary. The Institute provided a members-only place for like-minded African-Americans to read, learn, and discuss ideas and issues of the day. Going north on Broad Street, we arrive at the Union League of Philadelphia. Although you may know it today as a private, members-only social club, the original function of this and other Union Leagues was to promote loyalty to the Union and the policies of Abraham Lincoln. Caddo was one such member, actively recruiting African-Americans to fight in the Civil War. This is a sign that was posted to encourage African-American men to enlist. It would have been eight feet tall. Caddo helped raise 11 regiments of United States colored troops from the Philadelphia area who were sent to the front lines where many saw action. Caddo himself was commissioned as a major, but he did not fight in any battles. He was too important in his recruitment and organization roles. Moving south again, near Caddo's home, was the Pennsylvania Equal Rights League located at 717 Lombard Street. In 1864, Caddo went to a meeting of the National Convention of Colored Men in Syracuse, New York, where the National Equal Rights League was formed. He didn't waste any time, assisting in forming the Philadelphia-based Pennsylvania arm of the league upon his return to the city after this meeting. If you look closely at the cover page of these PERL minutes, you can see Caddo's name listed as publishing committee member. These leagues were the oldest nationwide human rights organization dedicated to the liberation of black people in the United States, first fighting for full citizenship rights for slaves freed by the Civil War, and then advocating for black voting rights after the war during the Reconstruction period. One popular method of transportation at the time was the trolley. They were cars pulled by horses and had a driver and a conductor. Although this was public transportation, it was segregated. Caddo fought fearlessly to desegregate the trolley car system until 1869, when his goal was finally achieved. One well-known act of the time took place on the afternoon of May 17, 1865, when he boarded a whites-only trolley car on the Pine Street line, which ran along Pine Street between the Delaware River and the Schuylkill River. The conductor, not wanting to be fined for forcing Caddo off the car, pulled over to the side of the road, detached the horses, and left Caddo in the car. 
Cato remained in the car overnight, sitting quietly. His civil disobedience tactics in support of civil rights gained the attention of local sympathizers and surrounding news outlets alike. People gathered around the car to see Cato's dedication, and newspapers as far away and well-known as the New York Times reported on the incident. This illustration depicts a conductor expelling a black man from a Philadelphia trolley car. Who knows? Perhaps it was Cato. One of Cato's favorite pastimes was playing baseball. Blacks were not allowed to play on white teams, so in 1867, Cato and his friend Jacob C. White founded the Philadelphia Pythian Baseball Club. They played in Fairmount Park, but their headquarters and clubhouse were here at 718 Lombard Street in Liberty Hall. This is the envelope from official Pythian correspondence, and here is a scorecard from a Pythian's game. Cato knew that he and his teammates could help prove that people were equals and should be treated that way. He petitioned to have his team admitted to the National Association of Baseball Players, which was like the Major League Baseball of his day. He was denied, but that didn't stop him from going from team to team to ask for a matchup. Finally, on September 16, 1869, the Pythians got their chance in a game against the Philadelphia Olympic Club. Although they lost to the Olympics 44-23, it was still an important turning point in the fight for equal rights. This newspaper article from the next day brings up the point that America was one of the only countries that still enforced racial segregation in sports and other areas of daily life. You may be surprised to learn that the Franklin Institute we know today was not always located in the building next to Logan Square. During Cato's time, it was here on South 7th Street. This map shows its location on the block. It held classes, had a sizable library, a 300-seat lecture room, multiple laboratories, an impressive library, and a school of mechanic arts, and was known as the most prestigious science and technology center in the United States. Here is a photo of the facade of the building that housed the Franklin Institute during Caddo's time, though today it is home to the Pennsylvania History Museum at the Atwater Kent. The building looks much the same today. In 1870, Caddo became the first black member of the Franklin Institute. Until this time, only whites had been admitted. Despite opposition from several white members, the leaders of the Institute supported his membership, citing his intellect and zeal for education. Fast forward to October 10, 1871. The 15th Amendment was freshly passed, which granted equal voting rights to all African American men. At that time, the Republican and Democratic parties were almost the opposite of how we think of them today, with the Republican Party promoting social change, having opposed slavery during the Civil War, while the Democratic Party was conservative, supporting segregation and white supremacy. Despite being granted equal voting rights, black voters experienced great difficulty in carrying out this newly won privilege. Some groups of white citizens attempted to discourage black voters from attending the polls through tactics of intimidation, harassment, and even violence. In fact, African Americans could only vote safely when United States troops patrolled the streets and protected the polling places from gangs of thugs who worked for the Democratic Party machine that still ran the city. However, there was no such protection available in the 1871 district attorney election, so Caddo and his Union League troops worked to protect and encourage the black community to vote. Caddo's polling location was here, at the corner of 6th and Lombard. On his way home from the polls, he was shot by Frank Kelly, a friend of the Democratic Party boss William McMullen. You may notice that Caddo is also pictured carrying a gun. Many reports stated that he had no bullets and carried the weapon only to defend himself. As word of Caddo's death spread, Republican supporters flocked to the polls, ensuring a victory for their candidate. On October 16th, Caddo received a public funeral second in size only to that of President Lincoln's in 1865. In 2006, a commemorative wreath-laying ceremony took place here, honoring Caddo's life and legacy. Other similar ceremonies have followed in the years since, always in late February. This not only marks the approximate date of Caddo's birth, but also comes at the end of Black History Month. Since Caddo's death, many buildings and organizations have been named for him. One such organization was the O.V. Caddo Elks Lodge No. 20. This is their official banner. From 1928 to 1991, it stood here at 16th and Fitzwater. As the mission of the Elks is to uplift the community and perform public service, Caddo provided a fitting namesake for the lodge. The O.V. Caddo Elks Lodge is still active today and has a new home on North Broad Street. In 2006, at the same time as the first commemorative wreath-laying ceremony, 
The O.V. Caddo Memorial Fund was established with the goal of raising $2 million to erect a statue near the grounds of City Hall and to educate the public about the civil rights hero. Its planned location is here, southwest of City Hall, facing the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. When completed, it will become the first public sculpture to honor a person of African-American heritage in the city of Philadelphia and will take its place among the iconic sites that make Philadelphia a city rich in cultural heritage. The Memorial Fund has already completed a project to provide a headstone at Caddo's burial site at Even Cemetery in Collingdale, Pennsylvania, which was previously unmarked. Not only does the headstone identify the resting place of Caddo in a fitting tribute, but in the words of Caddo Fund co-chair Carol Clark Lawrence, it calls attention to the right to vote and the responsibility for each of us to exercise that right. Think like Caddo and defend your rights. Work hard to learn about the world around you and use that knowledge to convince others to make positive changes. One person's thoughts, words, and actions really can make a difference. That is Caddo's legacy. This presentation was made possible through the Connecting Arts and Schools program of the Education Department at the Mann Center for the Performing Arts. The Philadelphia Freedom Festival has been supported by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, the Presser Foundation, and the Lomax Family Foundation.